And for more, let's cross to Brussels. Marc Pirini is visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe, former EU ambassador to Turkey. Thank you for speaking with us here on France 24. Good evening. First off, what do you make well, of, I think of the timing of all of this? Go ahead. Well, uh, the timing is uh, precisely uh, linked to uh, the situation uh, of the Turkish incursion in Syria, which is much more limited than initially planned, much more difficult than probably expected. Uh, Turkish forces have been boxed in by Russian forces together with the Assad regime. Uh, so there is some measure of uh, nervousness in, in Ankara. And also, we should not forget that this whole operation had no immediate uh, military uh, reason to happen now. It's essentially linked to uh, a, a degraded uh, situation for the president of Turkey, politically speaking. Now, of course, uh, in two days' time, the president of Turkey is supposed to be in the White House. So what you had is a uh, uh, first jihadist return, a U.S. citizen, apparently, who, when I checked an hour ago, was still uh, stuck in between uh, Turkey and Greece in this no man's land uh, that separates the two border controls. So this is an illustration, a small one, but an illustration of how difficult this is going to be. Uh, you just reported on, on the, the French uh, agreement with Turkey, what is called uh, in Paris the Kazanov Protocol. Well, this exists because there was an incident uh, before, and uh, it has been set up. It is extremely complicated to put in place because this is a one-by-one -one operation. You need to track on two police uh, organizations, one on each side, each individual. So it's going to be taking a lot of time. And it takes cooperation, of course, and goodwill. What we're hearing from Turkey today is rather confrontational more than cooperation. So we can expect quite a few problems. Then, of course, on top of that, you have the issue of those jihadists who have been deprived of their citizenship. This is a genuine issue for the jihadists concerned, but also for Turkey, because uh, they don't want, uh, they don't accept, uh, they say, that uh, people become stateless and are just dumped on their territory. And then, on top of all this, you have the situation of the families. Not jihadists, but families of the jihadists with the children, and that is also extremely complicated. So we're in for quite a few months of tensions. Quite a few months of tensions. Marc Pirini, uh, in the France 24 debate, we've talked about this a lot since uh, Turkey led that cross-border uh, incursion against the Syrian Kurds. And, well, a lot of viewers coming to the conclusion, and a lot of panelists as well, that in effect, with the outsourcing of where those foreign fighters are kept, uh, it is Europe's Guantanamo to a certain degree. Do you agree with that? Well, it all started in September 2015, if you remember the panic that uh, set up in, in Europe because of the refugee wave. And at that time, the European Council decided to put a lot of goodies on a silver tray and sent Mr. Donald Tusk, President of the European Council, to Ankara, present them to the President. This triggered a sort of six months long bazaar diplomacy. Uh, and well, uh, Ankara has learned the lessons. If you have panic on the European side, you can extract some concessions. Uh, I think it's high time to, for the European Union with the new executive coming in office hopefully pretty soon, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen, Mr. Charles Michel, and uh, Joseph Borrell as high representative, to bring the EU back in the discussion uh, on the Syrian settlement, which includes the, the fate of uh, European jihadists. The fate of European jihadists. So, for instance, France, what's it going to do? Turkey claims there are 11 French nationals in its jails. What's going to happen to them? Well, France has already taken in some of these jihadists in the past. Uh, it has taken in uh, children. So there is a, a policy in place. Unfortunately, it's not going to be uh, uh, the same thing in all member states. Um, so it is going to look extremely messy. And uh, Ankara is going to use 
discrepancies between uh, European countries. Also, you have the other dimension of, of, of this, which is the return of Syrian refugees from Turkey into Syria, which is the grand plan of Mr. Erdogan. There is no legal basis for this. There is no infrastructure on the ground. There is a fear of ethnic engineering behind it. Uh, and of course, there is reluctance from Syrians already settled in Turkey for a number of years to return. There too, you only have uh, the possibility of having an international agreement, preferably, of course, in the UN framework, to provide guarantees to these people on, on about what they're going to find on, on the spot, what will their status be, uh, especially if they are Kurdish, and also uh, who is going to monitor uh, their safety once they're back. And there, of course, you can imagine that uh, a lot of Syrians have a lot of misgivings about the policy of Mr. Assad. We, we talked at the outset of this conversation, Marc Pirini, about the timing of Turkey starting to send those foreign fighters uh, back. Uh, and you got to wonder, that interview that Emmanuel Macron gave last week uh, to The Economist, where he effectively read Turkey the riot act over what was going on with Syria's Kurds, and also to NATO, uh, saying uh, it was in a state of br brain death. Uh, has that helped or hurt? Well, uh, not sure it has helped. Uh, it has certainly put uh, very uh, harsh words on a reality, which is since the uh, failed coup of July 2016, uh, and then the Turkish incursion in Afrin, the Turkish incursion in Jarabulus, and now the third incursion, there is a serious malaise in NATO. Um, dialogue is not really going well, for the simple reason that uh, uh, Turkey is a part of the anti-ISIL coalition uh, and therefore is expected to at least uh, consult partners if it is going to take such a drastic measure as entering a third time uh, into Syrian territory. Uh, but that's not the only problem. You also have in NATO a serious malaise uh, for the past two and a half years uh, about the abrupt decisions of the uh, US president. In December last year, and again last month, President Trump decided united, unilaterally, without consultations, to uh, repatriate his own forces, leaving French and British forces on the ground, cooperating with them, uh, totally in, in the cold. Uh, so y you have a number of factors that uh, are behaving in, in a sort of very yeah, abrupt way. Yeah, I was going to ask you, this the is my final, this is my, I was going to ask you, um, the Russians. I was going to ask you, Marc Pirani, from where you are standing in Brussels, what are the optics going to be like a week from Wednesday when Recep Tayyip Erdogan gets the red carpet treatment at the White House? Well, um, you're never sure what the red carpet in the White House is going to lead to. Uh, there is now a, a last minute attempt by uh, the US to uh, have Turkey. Uh, give up on Russian missiles. I doubt it will work, but this is a last-minute attempt. And then the perspective is really sudden force of December when you have the NATO summit in London. And there you already have, from the European point of view, uh, a quadripartite uh, meeting between President Macron, Chancellor Merkel, Prime Minister Johnson and President Erdogan to precisely discuss the situation in Syria, discuss refugees and discuss jihadists. This is where uh, the, the uh, real discussion will take place, and then we'll see how the uh, European institutions will pick up from there. Ambassador Marc Pirini of the Carnegie Foundation, thank you for speaking with us from Brussels. Thank you.